Okay, cool. So, everybody, welcome again to another episode of Notes from the Aleph. An Aleph is a high point from which all things are visible, and from our vantage point, we'll be looking at tabletop role-playing games, their design, and the theory behind those designs. Around here, our motto is to be fair, build up, and have fun. I'm your host, Griffin Burrow, joined by our editor, Theta, our local designer, Norman Rafferty, and our good friends and GMs, Red Rabbit and Lessons Learned. When it comes to tabletop role-playing games, I have 15 years of experience running, playing, and frequently fixing problematic rules at the table. Pronouns are he, him, they, them. Lessons, why don't you go? Yeah, Lessons Learn one here on Twitch and Lessons Learn on YouTube. He, him, uh, writer over Amazon as well. Uh, Nights and Stars is my short story collection. Uh, Mass Effect Bridge Edition is on my YouTube. And I'm playing Dragon Age Inquisition Monday through Thursdays over at Twitch. All right, Red, why don't you give us a go? Hey, I'm Red Rabbit. I run our Wednesday morning Iron Claw game here on the Ractus channel. I also dabble in other games from time to time. Right now I'm running a vampire game um, that is probably going to wrap up soon. And I've got about a dozen other games planned that we'll see if they ever get off the ground. Um, I consider myself a student of narrative design and game design, and I'm happy to be here. All right. And of course, Rafferty. Hello, world. I'm Norman Rafferty, he, him. I work for Sanguine Games. Uh, in April, I'm going to be up at the First Square Convention in Wisconsin. So if you come by, tell me how wrong I am. There you go. So for today's topic, it's hard to deny that fighting and killing things is at the core of many tabletop RPGs. Your character has stats that make them better at killing. You gain levels of abilities focused on efficiently killing. And the books themselves have entire chapters dedicated to representing every aspect of a fight in detail with special rules about a variety of particular circumstances. Then we'll turn the page and see often such as avoiding a conflict with stealth or talking someone down with diplomacy, and they got like about a paragraph each. And it becomes very clear what the focus of the game is sort of on. So today we'll be talking about what alternatives you have to resolving conflicts and how to put a spotlight on those instead of murder. And so this this topic is definitely very near and dear to my heart because I feel the every Ever since I've started role playing, the first thing I will try to do is to avoid conflict at all costs. To the point that when I started GMing, uh, it was hard to make a villain. So I'm on the opposite side of uh, this conflict to begin with. But let's let's hear from someone who who has a better idea of how prevalent murder is here. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, I, I very much cut my teeth DMing on D and D, and I'm still running D and D. So combat is, it's fun, but it can get exhausting. Oh, absolutely. And also, sometimes I don't want to run a combat scenario, especially when I don't consider the the people. Over time, I moved away from what D and D actually says that certain groups are good and certain groups are bad. So when I expanded my mind and exploded into possibilities, it was like, wait a minute, they're all about their goals. So sometimes, many a time, not always, we can actually talk to some people. Like, I like to at least mix things up where someone will accept a parlay, someone will surrender, someone will certainly run away, you know, they will not fight to the death. Um, and I did, at least to me, that makes it interesting, but still the core of such as like Dungeons and Dragons and others is combat, and also as I'm entering the design space, I kind of find myself also designing to combat because it's what I know I'm comfortable with, and it's exciting and actiony, and I can see myself as a player shooting things and you know flying spaceships. Yeah, absolutely, and like the general like uh, advice given to people trying to write, uh, the classic one is, when you're not sure of what happens next, have two people burst in the door with guns, right? Start a fight. Have something interesting happen. Yeah, but I, mean, I also... Like games. Fighting is not... an easy thing to make interesting, right? But you do not want the one... You know, you don't want the situation where you have at least that one character is a talky character, and they're just that one character, and nobody else can talk. We talked about before, right? Fighter barbarians can't talk because they're made out of that, and yeah. Other characters can. Uh, so creating a balance in your own mind, maybe it's mechanical. It's maybe it's using the same rules to uh, deal with all kinds of conflict. But I think some games do that, and it just becomes overly complicated because then the combat is so discouraged that 
I'm talking about one, you know, the uh, burning wheel where I found literally the combat is, yeah, <laughs> rapidly. <laughs> but because you're encouraged to talk, mostly because people avoid combat because it's like, Ah, you're, in, you're encouraged to talk because the threat of having to play combat in burning wheel systems is so awful an experience yeah. that no one wants to do it um yeah, yeah but there's a there's a take for you in design um <laughs> I, i'm from the i'm from the old school where we used to play games like roll master or rune quest where not only is combat going to be incredibly complicated but you're just gonna get fucking killed I mean, to its credit, I, we dunk on D and D a lot. I think D and D is a good combat game. I enjoy the combat in D and D. I think they did a good job with it. And there's a reason why it's combat is so central to the mechanics, because it's that's you know I think it's a game that's good at that. It's not overly crunchy. It's also not overly simple. Um, not overly, there's a lot. I love when you say it's like it's not overly crunchy. My complaint about D and D five is it's too crunchy, and I fucking wrote Iron Claw. And you wrote Iron Claw, so I don't know what that's all about. Like, um, and I love Iron Claw combat as well. I'm angry at my games too. So, grr, everything sucks, okay. including me. God damn it. Um, but here's, well, it's 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 simpler than earlier because if you look at fourth edition, third edition, that's the, the the penalties and the bonuses just stacked I mean, up to ridiculous numbers. And yeah, it, that those feel. With the uh, mechanic of having just a roll to die, it's more complicated than OSR, which is why OSR is still around. Uh, well, true. There you go. But, um, okay. but there's something interesting too is that when we're talking about conflict in D and D, and in probably some other games as well, we're actually talking about like a framework of time management where other things can happen. Like even in combat, I th I think D and D is not as good at this as something like uh, Iron Claw, probably, but. When you're in combat, maybe your character isn't swinging a sword. Maybe they're sneaking around. Maybe they're messing with controls or trying to untie the hostages. Those things don't show up as often, but lessons, as you were saying, when you design these games, you try to think about ways to create more dynamic options within that combat. And maybe it's not as straightforward as just keep swinging swords until the other side is all pulp, right? So you can do interesting things within that combat framework, but how interesting it can get is kind of limited based on what the system lets you get away with. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, oh, did you want to say something, Griffin? Oh, uh, I was thinking of something, but you got something. Go ahead. Well, it, it's uh, like I've always been complaining about ringing the bell because like when a combat starts in a game, you ring the bell so a combat starts. We will now all bore everybody for a minute or two while the GM sets up the map. Uh, and then everyone will roll initiative and will scramble your order to confuse all of you and now rigidly play out a war game in front of all of you. And what's annoying about this is combat's the only time we do this. Like, if we said, okay, we've gone, now all of you have attended the gala ball with the other nobles. Everyone roll initiative. Okay, it's your turn. Say something, you know, do you, do you dance? Do you, you know, say something petty? We don't do that with anything else in the freaking game. Uh, and, and many games are guilty of this. Even role-playing, you know, games, not role-playing games like Vampire, which are supposed to be about that kind of stuff, combat breaks out, roll some fucking initiative dice. You immediately change, immediately tell all the players the mode of the game has changed from free-form role-playing to rigidly controlled combat where mistakes will dire and punished. Yeah, and I think well, I mentioned... that, that's a point. That's a point that when you go into the action or combat situation, it becomes life and death immediately. And I think that's the thing. You can have a, a non combat situation that can be as deadly or deadlier, right? Because it's like, oh, you didn't get that code for the new forehead. Well, what's that light anyway? And, you know. Yeah. And, and, but and... it, it isn't immediate. It, but if you were to say the situation was running to get the code input in a nuclear bomb, who gets there first? might be important well this right. is why i'm glad we, we've seen some sophisticated uh, like it, this is a very brute force idea but mm -hmm. I, I think it's working very well where they had the idea of completion clocks i mean i like to call them countdowns instead but uh there's an idea especially in blades in the dark and its twist where they would say okay here's a long-term project that requires eight ticks on this clock or whatever uh you need to get this down to zero before it happens, or they'll do the actually do the opposite. They'll say this clock is empty and fills at eight ticks. Whatever you have to do, eight doodads 
eight successes or eight or whatever to get this done. And now all of you can spend time trying to put points into this as an abstraction. This is kind of like combat. I mean, you kind of see the same thing with dispositions. But one thing I like about Blades in the Dark is they have the rigid times where they say, okay, it is now the downtime. During the downtime, what are you doing? And some of you might say, well, I'm working on getting better relations with this gang. I'm working on building the doomsday device so we can just steal everything we want. I'm working on infiltrating this thing. And they would be clocks that you could work on and wear down similar to a combat thing, like how you would well take all take turns to hit a thing to reduce its hit points to zero. You're all taking turns to hit something. And and that is a lot better than whatever abstract nonsense they had in D&D 4 with mm-hmm. the skill challenges, which were pretty much the same thing, only worded incredibly poorly. Right. Uh, and like, and obviously, I- like in my own experimentation, this is... This has turned out reasonably well, the least. Like, even just rolling initiative and then going through people and saying, all right, here's an open-ended scenario. What are you doing next? All right, that was your thing. Next person is kind of interesting, makes things kind of fair, and at least puts a little bit more tension on things, I think, it's what too. We do. Yeah, it's what you do in combat. Why wouldn't you use a similar proposal of, hey, we have a goal. What are each of you doing to solve it? Now, this yeah. gets into the, to what originally brought up as the core problem with all of this, which was uh, murder is all we good at, we're good at, which is where often the games make a mistake of making combat powers attractive or exclusive. It, it's like we talked about earlier. If I show up playing a Bruja, I'm here to kick ass. And the game, like, you know, makes me kick ass because all, most of my points and my special abilities go into that. Or if I'm a D&D fighter, or if I'm a street samurai in Shadowrun. So I might not have anything to do outside of combat. And that's where I, you know, start to complain about, like, you know, you know, this is where we have to say the game was bad because the game let the player build this character. It put in their head you could build a character who only does combat and then showed up at your game where we expect people to do things other than combat. 99 skills and only one that matters, right? And none of that actually punishes you if you don't do that. Because when combat comes along and you put points or whatever something else, you're not at least in earlier version Shadowrun at least, uh, version in extreme combat, the other, your enemies are are, you know, full on on combat, so they know how to use their guns, whatever. You're gonna take a hit, you're gonna get killed. Or your party members are gonna get killed. Right, and and this goes back Oh, go ahead. So when it comes back to you, be okay. Now you're the. Yeah, but I wanted to have a you know five skill points on on guitar, electric guitar. Well, there are no electric guitars here. To somebody to death with. So use your gun instead. And oh well, I missed. I missed. I missed. Oh my god, we're all dying. Yeah, and and this gets back to what I did, what I described earlier is the fail forward problem. Uh, or we just discuss failure is like if the only place we can actually lose is combat because once again there's this thing going on of well the game we we can't stop the game because you guys couldn't open a door yeah you know, we can't stop the game for that likewise we can't stop the game if you guys couldn't find a clue or we can't stop the game if you couldn't talk to the one person who can help you therefore we can't make that a role that you can fail but combat if you failed all your roles will kill you. Well, there's, well, there's another thing there is that there's a lot more. It's a lot more great gradated, granular. Like you can't, the the systems are unevenly weighted. You get to make a lot more decision points in combat, which means that combat is always going to feel more like you have more agency than if you fail a single skill check that you really didn't have much of a much of a chance to choose on your own anyway. In most cases, if you've got eight skills. And your GM says that two of them apply. He's giving you a choice that often you won't even have, right? Right. And and this was a complaint I used to have about games like Call of Cthulhu, the horror investigation game. You'll make one library use, you know, a skill called library use. You'll roll it exactly once to justify eight hours of book research. But if you get in a fight, you'll roll your pistol skill three times around. So like okay. imme- you know, immediately, you know. Uh, and if you failed that one library use roll, it doesn't matter if you had a 90% in it. You failed the roll. Whereas with the pistol, we'll give you several tries. And, and yeah. that's, that's where, like, that's where the granularity, but I, but I think a lot of games, like, overcorrect on that. Like, Burning Wheel is one of the huge offenders on that, 
where Burning Wheel turns every affair into this attack, defend, faint, disposition, nonsense. Uh, you know, that, that makes everything incredibly tedious and, and doesn't even guarantee your success or failure anyway. I mean, really what yeah. my complaint was about all of murder is all we know about is the storytelling conceit we discussed in an earlier stream, which was um, murder is the only way you, combat is the only lose state. If you run out of hit points, you will die. I mean, d and might res you, but they're not going to res you in fucking vampire. Like, if you go past Torpor and finally take that 21st aggravation point, that's it. And and yeah. so, um, you know, or Shadowrun. So, I would, you know, I, I would say something about Power of the Apocalypse games is that they, they discourage a little bit of that because, for example, when you get to combat, you're not supposed to roll die for every sword swing, right? You know, you're supposed to do an action and it has consequences and then someone else does something different. And it has consequences uh, because well, if you try to just roll for every single sword swing, it it really breaks down, right? It's so, funny I, mean, I would definitely that. say all these options are weighted a lot more evenly because even yeah. during a fight, you could say, "I would like to appeal to a sense of honor to accept my surrender and roll that," and that's the same as rolling your sword. There, it's the exact same roll, even well, it and, even have the same stat. And I kind of want to cut you off there by saying it's funny that you mentioned that because many Power by the Apocalypse are guilty of what we've just mentioned where they'll have a completely separate set of mechanics. For oh, example, yeah. Apocalypse World just has, if you want to go aggro or seduce someone, you roll, 10 or better at work, 7 or 9, you compromise. One roll, one and done. Combat, suddenly you have hit points. All weapons are rated in how much hit point damage they do, despite the fact that NPCs don't have hit points. And then they'll have special qualities on them, like whether they're short range or double barreled or auto fire or that kind of stuff. A level of granularity on the weapons that you do not see on any other tools or food or resources or in the game. For some reason, combat got a lot more screen time in a game that doesn't have any rules. That's a fair point. I was going to bring up PBTA for exactly what uh, Griff said and what Lessons was getting to also is that like it's cool to see a simple mechanic that is applied in a broad brush across, you know, all these different moves are theoretically equally weighted, but that's a good point, Raph. And I think again, that's because there's that narrative bias towards action movies and action stories, which is where a lot of these genres evolved from, you know, people like stories about heroes in dangerous scenarios and as a sub as as a consequence like not to get political there's a reason why people brag about their gun collections but not about their kevlar vest collections right hey, some, like, some of us brag about our pony collection um <laughs> sure the um i well i mean i want to get a little more meta here it's like okay so stories by their very nature are about conflict you know somebody wants something and somebody else doesn't like be person versus person person versus nature person whatever they're about some kind of conflict and role-playing games grew out of war games. The simplest to understand conflict is combat. I want to kill you, and you don't want to be dead. So we are now in conflict, because I'd be a lot happier if you just died. So that's why we have to game that out, because you know we, now we have to we're, and we're rolling dice to arbitrate that. If we were in a diceless game, the game master would just tell me if I killed you. So... Um, and the original games grew out of this of like, you know, let's go ahead and, and moderate this kind of conflict. And then also combat has the advantage that it's very, I want to say, objectifiable. We know what a sword is. We know what a gun is. We know what people are and about how fast they can move. We know they have two hands. A lot of this can be modeled in a way that we could wrap our brains around. If I say he runs 30 feet and swings at you with a sword, we all know what that means. If I say he tries to use a French Balmont to appeal to your sense of bonhomie and, and higher education, convince him to move to his trade agreement, we might spend a little more time trying to decide what all the fuck that meant. 
Right. Trying to, like, particularly write the rules of human social interaction is a thing people frequently attempt in the real world for real reasons, and they fail miserably because there aren't really a whole lot of rules to it beyond it's a game that we're all actually playing with each other that we all kind of make up in the oh, first yeah, and place. I just, I just but also... there's a secondary part to it, too, where I think part of the lack of appeal to, say, doing a negotiation is always that the results are always reversible. Like you said, a fight is a objectifiable you won it or you lost it and that's not really going to change that fight but if a talk happened and you reach an agreement then later on someone comes by and like backstabs you or uh changes the deal or something and players will hate that and then they'll say we'll never talk again because we can't trust anyone oh yeah well, like it, it's in the news right now uh one thing to complain about is the doctor who role-playing game uh they're making a new one and they're going to base it off of D&D. Now, the Doctor Who game by Crucible 7 is one of my favorite RPGs of all time. And one of the neat things it did in that game was their initiative system, where they said, okay, when a combat or violent encounter goes off, you do your actions in this order. First, the talking, okay, then the fleeing, and then the fighting. And they said, like, if someone wants to negotiate, they always go first in the round. And, like, why is that? Well, because of what Griffin just mentioned. Uh, there's no point in me trying to negotiate on my low initiative role because you already shot the guy. Like if you already, if the kill crazy character already killed somebody, we're not going to negotiate. We just kill one of your guys. So they let the negotiators go first and then they let the fleeing go first because once again, players have a tendency to respond that they shot or they wounded a guy so he can't get away or they shot at us, therefore we have to shoot back. No. Anyone who chooses to flee gets to start fleeing immediately before shots get fired. And, you know, you, you can't be one shot killed before that shows up. And the reason why they did it that way was rules endorse behavior. Uh, they, uh, Doctor Who is not a combat game. And they enforce this in their combat rules by putting in stopping the fight happens before the fight. And this is actually very funny in terms of like trying to replicate the medium that they're going for. Literally, the exact way every Doctor Who episode goes is that, well, they found the dangerous thing. The Doctor looks at it and goes, well, that's really bad. Turns to his companion and goes, we should just go ahead and run and get out of here as everyone is like drawing their guns on them. Right. And, then and it the starts the chase scene, you know, through the empty quarry and everything. Right. And the people who stay behind, you know, the ones who get killed, the ones who stay behind shooting the indestructible thing. But, but, but that's an example of like rules endorsing behavior and actually writing a not. That's why I always complain about like the way this is written. This game's actually written in a way that you could actually get away. If you try to do it with the D&D &D rules and roll the initiative, the guy with the highest dex is also the best shooter. So they're going to go first. Yeah. And of course, everyone moves at the exact same rate at all times as well. So you literally cannot physically escape a battle. Right. And, and monsters in D&D &D always have more movement than you. So you're fine. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. but, right. And, and those are examples. Right. So you can write the rule, like, like the mere way the rules are written. Like, there's going to be some people who in the comments will point out not every Power by the Apocalypse game has the concept of hit points and, and that kind of stuff. And, like, yeah, those the non-combat, you know, versions, or those are the ones who did some more thinking about it, about how they wanted to implement this. Like, Masks is a lot more loosey-goosey about combat than the core power by the Apocalypse is. But, like yeah. I said, it's worth pointing out, they still wrote it that way. So, um, yeah, uh, oh. it, it, I'm sorry, go ahead. Also, I talk about loosey-goosey, I, I think, again, on the other side of the wall, of initiative wall, things are more loose, so... It sometimes when a lot of this stuff just gets thrown to skills, like instead of being an ability or power, it's just you have a skill, a diplomacy skill, an intimidation skill, or, or ability, a, a a charm, or, or seduce, or or mind control, or whatever. Right. Um, part of the I think part of the reason is again, if you're if you're gonna do PvP, again, you know clearly what can happen, right? You, I can set my character against your character, and that's it. But if I use, say, seduce, and I roll a die, and I seduce you, you know, do I accept that? Right? Should I? Should yeah, I be forced and you to actually, that? Okay, here is, like, I can't get over, like, speaking of Rafferty hates D&D &D 5, D&D &D 5 has done one of the worst possible things it could do. Like, worse on the level of, you know, racial coding orcs. 
in previous versions of D&D, the diplomacy skill could not make anyone do anything. The diplomacy skill could only change their personal reaction to you. So you could change someone from hostile to neutral or neutral to friendly. But it never made them do anything. It only changed them, you know, like if someone was friendly, they might help you. But you, there was no skill in the game. I mean, there's spells for it. But there's no skills in the game to compel people to do anything. In D&D 5, they got rid of that and they went back to persuasion. Make a roll, they do what you want. Because D&D has, you know, like got rid of nuance. And, and like, like that was one thing that I thought was always cool about D&D, that I could make people friendly and then we could stop the fight and talk to them. But apparently D&D 5 doesn't have time for that. Yeah, and uh, I, I think definitely here we we may have hit upon this at some point in the past as well. Like the verbiage of like these skills, what they mean, or what verbs are even given to the players in the first place, drastically paint the picture of, or at least set the frame of like what everything the players can do is. Right? If you don't have a skill to talk to people, well, then you know there's no game consequence to it at all. Right. I mean, like, like it was the idea that many player power by the apocalypse automatically start you off with a diplomacy stat, like, uh, you know, like, you know, how, how, you know, hard or cool or whatever that allows you to point at people and say, I make them do things. The mm -hmm. problem, of course, being you could make that your dump stat and not care. And, and then there's the question of if I have a skill that compels you to do what I want, um, is that combat? Uh, in mechanical terms, you could absolutely do it. You could have social combat. You could have intellectual combat. And you could go through these same mechanical steps that you do for a fight and put those into a different context or run it that way. It probably would be really awkward at first, but there's there's the theoretical possibility you could do that, right? And thus, Burning Wheel. And thus, Burning I mean, well, Wheel, I suppose. Burning Wheel is rough. I think a better example will be vampire at least the fifth edition has conflict rules that basically i don't know if they pull it off perfectly but i do appreciate the attempt they wrote conflict rules that are supposed to work mechanically the same whether you are shooting guns at people or trying to discredit them in front of their their benefactors can you like, take aggravated social damage you can you take willpower is basically hit points that can also take superficial or aggravated damage oh that's and wonderful. It's it's weird, but it's kind of fun. I think we talked about this a little bit when we were talking about the objective. Yeah, I think nature. I've mentioned like Requiem Second Edition's version with social doors, but it says like if you want to get favors and force people to do something, you got to spend like weeks or months like actually being friendly with them. Yeah, which is an interesting take to do it. It's it's cool. I I think the um, it falls apart when you're being where combat is objective, like Raf said social interactions are less so you know if you fail a hit roll with a sword you know what happens you miss the dude with the sword or it bounces off his armor if you make a good argument and then roll your check the end result of that could be a failure and what does that look like do they do you flub your argument does the person you're trying to appeal to just not buy it like do they hate you now hard? forever do they actually whip out their yeah. sword and go that joke was so terrible i'm stabbing well, you now well and the other thing is also that the yeah sorry there's also the problem that you have players who simply cannot tell you what they give you give you a convincing argument on the spot it's like what well, do i say to this person Oh, yeah, man, there's a lot of yeah. players who can't tell me how they physically swing a sword. I've seen that too. See, so. I, I think this system works well for that because you don't have to come up with the argument. You can say, I just want to appeal to their sense of honor, right? I'm like, okay, well, that would be like an insight because you're trying to like end a charisma. You're using your personal charm and you're trying to play on their sense of honor, whatever. So then they can just roll and you can say, well, this ended up doing three, you know, they resisted with a roll. This did like three points of superficial willpower damage to them right and once you max out that track much like with physical damage they're impaired but they're socially impaired they've lost their cool which means they take penalties on trying to convince people and act in a social setting so there's right. an elegance to the symmetry of the design but the execution is always a little more a little fuzzier well that that i think is a better like i'm not a big fan of games that compel people like the apocalypse world games and some other games have dubious consent like, if you just, like, make people do stuff. So that system of vampire of, um, I mean, I like that because it means I win that you, you can make 
you can get your way because you have reduced the other person to the point where they can't stop you. Uh, because yeah. they've, they've whatever that looks them. like. So they've lost so much status, which is usually like that. That's like, like you can't use social skills on players. Like we've mentioned, that's why I liked some of the wording in some of the earlier, like D and D's or some other games where it just says, okay, you know, uh, you know, we'll just give you a minus five to all your attack rolls. Cause you're scared. Uh, no penalties to run away. Minus five. To, if you attack choose. And uh, that's why iron claw just flat out says, if you're afraid, Nope, you can't attack because people yeah. would still choose to attack with a minus five. It's like, nope, Wouldn't you can care. stay here all you want. You don't have to leave, but you're not allowed to fight. So choose wisely. And um, so this is how you can, I mean, again, back to the, the vampire thing, the, your pool of willpower points doesn't really, at first glance, you'd think, oh, it's just hit points for social combat. I might go a whole session without using them. But then when you realize that your willpower is something you spend to increase your role, your success chance yes. on rolls, people are dipping into that all the time because the system is weighted so that you really do need to spend those willpower points if you no, want to succeed at things. Yeah, see, as soon as you said that, like, you spoke Rafferty's language because I'm the one who always shows out. Like, I never understood earlier versions that made it so cheap. Like, Rafferty would show up with 10 willpower points and they're going, what the fuck? And like, boom! I willpower every roll! Fuck you! I'm getting shit done! I never lose, yeah. Yeah, I never left. I never lost my virginity. Uh, so, um, yeah, you just blow through everything, and like GMs were always confused by this. So having a rule in the game that they can just insult or berate me, and I lose my willpower, like that's the way to get rid of right? a problem like me. It's uh, interesting, you know. It's it's a cool idea, and again, I think it, it doesn't maybe express exactly how you should model that in narrative terms mm -hmm. in a great way, because sometimes it's a little bit confusing to be like. Okay, so now whose turn is it? I mean, you just insulted them. Do they insult you back? Or they're rolling a separate roll to resist your insulting? And it, it doesn't map one-to-one -one in a visual objective way. Well, but it's, it's still it's very like, cool. It sounds like the implementation is flawed, but the theory is pretty sound. Also, I want to introduce the fact that value of the NPC uh, as, a, as a character and so Because one of the reasons why it's very easy to get into combat from the player point of view is that uh, these are just bags of MSP or whatever and I'll take their treasure and that's it. It's the easiest way right, to do it. Right, they dehumanize the game. In yeah, the but if you have mechanics that emphasize the value of the NPC as something more than just a, a bag of XP or other yeah, in, in currency... Fact, that's a yeah. point I want to jump on, which is, okay, so getting back to like how many role-playing games have text in them of, you know, not many people want the real world in their game. It's a fantasy. A lot of these role-playing games are sold on the idea that you are the center of the universe. Make your own character. Realize your own dreams. Be beautiful. And the world revolves around you. And then the way they write the adventures, they revolve around you. Everyone comes to you for help. Shops exist. You can just buy stuff. The masquerade allows you to wander around freely with superpowers that no one else knows about. Ooh, you're so cool. Ooh. There's all, all this stuff that's wrapped around it. So the rest of the world's opinions don't matter. They don't do anything. In Shadowrun, you're already a criminal. There's no star rating. You're just more criminal. And in Dungeons and Dragons, though, you could be the worst chaotic evil asshole in the world. When the GM throws Tyrant Queen or Candle Keep on the table, suddenly you're a good guy. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, despite everything, it, it you know, like everyone will forgive you for your previous war crime. Uh, it, it's the you don't track with the rest of the world. So there's no cachet or value. In, in you know being decent and then on top of this Rafferty's complaint there's no laws or controls in the world there's no places you go that you know there's no weapon controls you try to take like you try to run an adventure where the players have to go to an event that they're not allowed to bring weapons and your game grinds to a halt for 10 fucking minutes because yeah, you try like, to explain it to them as so you try to this explain is, yeah so this is where blades in the dark is nice where it hits two out of three of those. It doesn't hit the last one, which uh, which we've already covered before. Yeah, you, I mean, you can just walk around with weapons, but it makes you care about others and care about the world. Yeah, well, you want to do something other than murder. But actually, the other uh, th those type of games do have a load system. Yeah, but I, I, means... as I've complained, it, it, it's it's silly. It does at least attempt it. L l like the load system doesn't mean I didn't come to the event with a gun. It means I don't have a gun until I declare I have one. Because I could come to your event with a light load and still have a blunderbuss and two pistols under my gun. Yeah, but I think the way it's supposed to work, if it's unwell, that, that's, is, yeah, it's, that's it's concealability. In other words, right. That's the way it's supposed to work. 
That's not the you way it's done. Full, the, full load, then everybody knows right. you come for bear. And, and, and the other you. problem, but I think the focus here is on is on the world and the PCs and giving a right. desire to do something to them other than murder them. Right. Because my problem with Blades in the Dark was they don't define what the law is. Mm -hmm. it, it's apparently some sort of weird police state where the policemen. First of all, there's policemen, which is like nonsensical. You wouldn't. You don't have policemen. Um, the, they're a modern conceit for people who pay taxes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like uh, they have the gray shirt, and 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 the gray shirts or the blue shirts can arrest you for any reason and detain you indefinitely. Which, once again, that's not breaking the law. That's some. If they could just abduct you, that that's fascism at best, and already every tabletop game at worst. Where you know, like it doesn't matter if I'm carrying a concealed weapon; they can just arrest me because they don't like me. Right, of course. So they don't. There's no. There's no rules in there for probable cause or carry concealed weapon permits or anything. So, like that's though one... I think. Yeah, though I think it might actually be a good example of another system that at least uh, awaits combat, similar to other options. Intimidating the guards off, stabbing them, or trying to bribe them are all at least equal actions to resolving a conflict. Well, the Blades in the Dark game started treating uh, enemies as different levels, and you would just mm -hmm. need to overcome them. So yeah, you could blow their faces off, but you could also sneak past them, you know, or you know, deceive them or that sort of thing. And you just have to beat yeah. their level. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's not very simulationist that way. It's like everyone's a challenge. And then you it's just, very, you very know. abstract, that's for sure. Right. It, it, the, the weapons, they don't have a separate system for weapons. Everything in the game is rated in a tier, and that's what it does. And, uh, and, and yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it's what makes the game go very smoothly. I mean, you can still buy specific abilities that only like have a meaning in combat, but they automatically give everybody like something to do outside of it. And right. uh, no, I, I think basically just what I would what I would want to sum up uh, all of this with is, um, I mean, the thing I was really just going to complain about is the game. The real issue here, I guess, would be that the games are often framed like like I'm. The games are often framed in the way of you are a character, you are special. This is an adventure. It's just for you. You can do whatever you want. And then we get in the Grand Theft Auto problem of. You can kill all the people you want in Grand Theft Auto, just duck into a building and your star rating goes. Um, the, the, um, but also, like, there's the problem, you know, the, the, the core problems of we didn't give you enough social skills to deal with the, the problem. But I also want to wrap around, once again, fail forward is always lurking in the background. You could be the biggest asshole in the world. You can't use socialness to solve your problem. I don't see this in, like the thing I'm annoyed about in all of these games is when they have the scripted combat encounter. Like I was complaining about Dragon Heist. We resolve the rival gang when they show up and we get into a fight. In theory, we should be able to resolve this a number of different ways. We could bribe them to leave, we could expose them to the police, we could join them. You know, a lots of ways that you could resolve this without combat, but there's no provisions for that. Everyone expects the players are inculcated to expect we're going to fight because that's what a game is. And mm -hmm. um, the game is wrapped around combat as being exciting. And what we really need in these games is wrapping around the eye. We need to put the idea in players and GM's heads. It's okay to win the, the day without mm -hmm. murder. Yeah. And that's a yeah, good that, way to go that, ahead and wrap it up. Lessons, what you got? Yeah, that for me would be investment in NPCs, uh, my old kind of art of goal-based uh, objectives rather than, you know, XP and all that. And uh, also, you know, when you go to the GM section, really uh, talk to your uh, GMs and say, you know, think of different ways that your players can tackle this. They may not use all of them. They might not use any of them, but if, they, if they're in your toolbox, when they come up with something other than combat, or you can actually encourage them to go to do something other than combat, that at least uh, you know surprises you know you know makes your game more interesting other than just being one combat encounter after another. Right, and Red, what what do you got to end this all off on? Um, I would say um, there's a lot of cool games out there that try to take alternate approaches to non-combat conflict or even just like uh challenges that have a more interesting or a more universal mechanical effect 
But I would also recommend if you're playing D&D, which you are, let's be real, um, try to, uh, if you're making combat encounters, consider operating, working in areas within the combat that you can use other aspects of your character sheet. Give them opportunities to try to negotiate mid-combat or incorporate traps or things in the combat environment that would call on different ab- character abilities beyond their attacks and their defenses, right? That's it for me. All right, and that's going to be it for today for Notes for the Alef. We stream episodes bi-weekly Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can come join us live at Twitch at twitch.tv slash Ractus. We also stream and record weekly tabletop games at the same channel, and you can come join us when we start at 10 a.m., 2 p.m., and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Sundays and Wednesdays. Norman Rafferty here is a partner and writer for Sanguine Games. Check out sanguinegames.com. Join us on Reddit and Twitter, and look forward to the upcoming book of Corals. Uh, lessons learned here is uh, you can find him at Lessons Learned One on YouTube and Twitch, and of course check out all of his good work on Amazon.com. And of course, go ahead and be sure to book a game with Red Rabbit over at StartPlaying.Games as Red Rabbit, and be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and come see us all again. Until next time, everybody. See ya. And don't be afraid to let people end combat prematurely with their crazy teleportation spell or whatever it is. That's the other thing. Exactly. Or bypass entirely.